bringing my coffee in this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Why, did someone spill already? No. <laughs> but most likely my brain, I spill it. And my body's, my body hurts today. All of these on Monday after Sunday and pulling track. Sunday's a long day, yeah. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And by the way, you can actually go to our webpage, ccinland.org, and Brother Michael has set up a media page where you can look at our devos from 2017, 18, and all through this year if you want to go back and, and take a look at them. So they're available to you on YouTube and other messages too, Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings as we're going through Genesis, uh, all the way through uh, Leviticus, and we'll be starting Numbers this coming Wednesday if you'd like to join us. And if you're in the neighborhood, come join us. We're here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are in 2 Corinthians, and we will be in chapter four. Good morning, Diana. <clears throat> what is your client's name? Just kind of interested so I can say good morning to her. I don't know if she's, she heard me or not. Mama? They call her Mama? Call good morning, Mama. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we, we just come before you humbly, Lord. Seeking, Father, the wisdom that, that comes from you, Lord, which is far above any man's wisdom that we could ever imagine, Father. But we thank you that you do give man wisdom, Lord. There is a certain amount of wisdom that you give to us, Lord God, that we could live in this world. I, I think about the vehicle, the car, and how you have given man that ability to create this motor vehicle that can just take us uh, all over the place, Father, from nearby to thousands of miles away, Father, and, and in a reasonable time, Lord. And it's just amazing, Lord, that you have given us that wisdom to do that, Lord. I know sometimes, Father, we take away uh, from you, Lord, by assuming and thinking that it's our own wisdom and that we're just very smart people. But the fact is, Lord, it's because of God. And when you think about it, it makes sense because if God created the heavens and the earth, and everything in it, I mean, if he caused this earth to rotate at a certain speed in a certain atmosphere within uh, its um, sphere of galaxies, then why can't he give man the ability to make a car? Uh, it's pretty amazing when we truly, by faith, believe that our God is able. And we believe that, Lord, with all our heart. And we thank you, Lord. And we want that wisdom today, Lord. So give it to us, Father, through your spirit. May we receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Shirley. Hi, Shirley. I'm glad you're watching with us, Shirley. God bless you. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Good morning, Diana. The other Diana. Glad you're with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll start with verse 1. And obviously Paul says, Therefore... Whenever you read therefore, or the word for, or the word since, you always have to go back and look at what he was talking about earlier. So verse 18, he left off with, we all with unveiling faces beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord <clears throat> are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. And you remember that Paul was talking about the veil that was put upon Moses' faith, which is a representation of the law, and how it was fading away to something better, which is God's grace through his son Jesus Christ, which we are to put on, which is far better than the law itself. And so he says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. So Paul is telling the Corinthians here that not only the apostles, but all of us have the ministry that Christ has given to us. And what is that ministry? To preach the gospel of grace. That is really our ministry. That is everyone's ministry. If you want to know your call, your call is to be a light and salt to the world. You are to take opportunities to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's our only hope. There's no hope in this world. There's no hope in mankind. 
Our hope is only in God and what he has revealed through his son, Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. And he has revealed a lot. And it is a great hope, Paul uh, said in another place. It's a glorious hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's the hope of the gospel. The gospel message is simple and it's very clear that God himself came and became a man. And he died at the hands of man. He took our sins upon his shoulders, forgiving us of our sins and appropriating through his sacrifice alone salvation. And the hope of that salvation and the evidence of it is his resurrection from the dead. So we are believers that don't have, that, that live with hope. We're not without hope. We have the hope of God. One day we will go home to be with him. Just like all our loved ones who have passed from this life are in heaven and they're awaiting us. They have a new body. They're new creatures completely. They're complete. They're joyful. Um, man, that's the ultimate end. You know, <clears throat> when we think about the ultimate end, the ultimate happy, uh, sometimes people will look forward to the weekends, right? Work will be over. Friday night, phew, weekend's coming, we're going to Disneyland. So they're looking forward to Disneyland, or they're going to the beach, or we're going to the mountains, or we're going to go skiing. And they look forward to these things. This is the hope at the end of the week. And when they are there, they're like, we're here. Man, and now we just enjoy it. It's like the time of their life. That's what they worked for. That's what they were hoping for. Same with heaven. Eventually, we all go to heaven, and we're there, and it's exactly what we were waiting for. No more pain, no more suffering. We're finally there. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. Our, our hope is not without hope. <laughs> you know, if you don't have hope, then something's wrong with your faith in Jesus Christ. And, and really, that's, that's the truth. If, if we are hopeless people, it's because we're not putting our faith in Christ. And that means that we are doubting God and we're doubting his word and we're telling him that your word isn't true and what you said isn't true because I don't believe it. it that's ultimately what we're doing logically. But when we realize, no, what he said is true and it's going to happen, then we believe it with all of our heart and no one's gonna sway us from that because it's the truth. And so Christians know that and because they're born again, they live joyfully in the Lord of the hope of the gospel message. So he says, we receive that with mercy and we don't lose heart. How can you lose heart at such a great message? You don't. And he says this twice, by the way, so it's encouraging. Verse two, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, what Paul is saying here is that we put our faith totally in the word of God. And he mentioned that earlier in chapter three, how we are to live by the word, that God has given us a sure thing that is the word of God. Not by man's thoughts, not even by my own thoughts, what I think is right. You know, sometimes people will go, well, I think, I'm like, well, I don't really... I don't really care what you think. I want to know what the Bible says. I mean, I get that you think, and that's wonderful that you're thinking, you know, but what does the Bible say? And then is your thinking conforming to what the Bible says? Because it should be conforming to Scripture. And so Paul's saying we have the Word of God, and we don't mishandle it deceitfully. And there are people that handle it deceitfully. We all sometimes handle it deceitfully, if we want to be honest. There's some that purposely handle it deceitfully, and they'll literally preach a message that's going to um, profit them. And we call them faith teachers, uh, prosperity teachers. And they are trying to encourage people. Uh, it, it's almost like motivational speakers that if you um, give to my ministry, uh, then God will bless you, and you're like playing the lottery. So if you invest a thousand, then God will give you a hundredfold. And if you invest more, he'll give you even more. And, and then you'll hit the big times. And if you have the faith, and of course, when they do that, some of them get blessed, but I don't believe it's because they planted seeds. It's just God's Amen. grace. Some of them don't get blessed. And you know how they rationalize that? The minister will tell them it's because your faith lacked. It wasn't your seed, it was your faith. So you need more faith. So plant more seed which will show your faith, and it just continues to cycle around. And that's, that's mishandling the word of God, because the Bible doesn't teach that. 
We all, guys, we have to take the Bible within its context. And you have to find the context which in, within each chapter and what Paul is saying to the people that he's speaking to at that culture and at that time. And then you get the right interpretation of that. And then you find the application here. So we have to have, basically what he's saying here is handle the word of God truthfully. Handle it honestly. Read it honestly. Read it truthfully. Take it for what it's saying to you, literally. That's how we ought to take it. So he says we don't do that. We don't handle it deceitfully because uh, we're concerned for men's conscience. Uh, we want to minister to men and that they have a right understanding of the gospel. Verse 3, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now this is a, a statement of fact here. Sometimes you minister to people and you're trying to share the truth with them, but for some reason they, they're like, I don't, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. That means that the veil is still over them. They can't see that truth. And the reason that they can't see it is because they're perishing. Perishing means they're going to hell, basically. They're being separated from God. Now, until God opens their eyes and their understanding, they're perishing is what he's saying. There's still a veil over them, the veil of works, of the law. They think they're going to get to heaven because they're a good person and they're good people. I mean, and, and I get that feeling because you treat your children good, you love your husband and your wife good, you know, you're a good citizen, you pay your taxes, you try not to cuss too much, you know, you try to do good things, you give a couple of dollars to homeless people, so you feel good. But the reality is none of us are good. Ultimately, in the end, our hearts are wicked and deceitful, the Bible says. That's another truth. and We have to receive that. So if the Bible says we're wicked and deceitful, then we need someone outside of ourselves, and that's Jesus Christ. We're perishing. And so we need to pray that God would take the veil off of our eyes so that we understand. So he says, <clears throat> he gives more information here about that veil. In verse 4, whose minds, the God of this age, who's the God of this age? Satan. Satan. He's the one that causes us to be blind. He's the one that hinders us. He's the one that whispers in our ears worldly things to pull us away from Christ. <clears throat> so the God of this age has blinded us. Who's blinded us? Satan has blinded us who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. It's Satan who puts that veil over us through lust, through various things to keep us blinded from the truth. <clears throat> and so we need to recognize that Satan wants to keep us from the truth. And the truth is of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sakes. Now, he's repeating kind of what he said in, in uh, chapter 4 of, of 1 Corinthians. You remember we went over that on Sunday, how Paul said that we're servants, we're the last mm -hmm. of apostles. And he just reedifies that right here, that we preach not ourselves. When a message is being preached, we preach that the Savior is Jesus Christ. The Savior is not the pastor. And I, I think I make that pretty clear to everyone, that I can't save you and that I can't really give you the hope. I don't have all the answers. It's only Jesus Christ that has all the answers. He is your Savior, and you need to look to Him. I need to point to Him. If anything, I am just a servant serving. Now, I don't necessarily go to your house and mow your lawn <laughs> or wash your dishes. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about serving of the Word, leading people in the gospel message, interpreting the Scripture so they understand it so that they can um, have a deep relationship with God. That's how a minister serves, by counseling, giving wisdom, and interpreting the scriptures and giving application. That's our responsibility as pastors, as Paul says here. Verse 7. No, verse 6. For it is the God who it is the God who commended light to shine out of darkness who has shunned in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So God gave that message to Paul, to the apostles. And we have that message today written down in our Bible. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not in us. So again, it's the power of the gospel message. It's the message that has the power, not the man we're just the messenger of the message. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, 
but not despaired, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Now, what is Paul saying there? He's talking about his trials, right? Now, I don't believe he's complaining. He's just stating a fact. He's stating a fact that we are hard-pressed as apostles. We are always pressed upon by the enemy and by people. He's not saying, poor me, I'm always pressed upon. Would you feel sorry for me and help me out? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, this is the fact. This is what happens, that I'm always being pressed on every side. I'm being perplexed, perplexed. But he goes, I don't despair. See, so it's not a complaint because he knows who he believes in. I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken because God loves me. Uh, people may forsake me. People may abandon me. You know, it's sad. I get what Paul's saying here because there are people that you invest in and they go to your church and, and they come and they say all kinds of beautiful things and how they want to see it grow and help out and do this and do that. And then all of a sudden they leave and you just go, what was that about? You know, and it's the fact. Now, I'm not losing hope or despair. I have a work to do, and I'm gonna to continue to do it with or without them. That's the key. But it's sad that people would go through all of that and then just leave without even saying bye or anything. It's kind of sad. But Paul endured those things. He said, I was struck down, but I'm not forsaken or destroyed. And I'm always caring about the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what he's saying is, the things that I've gone through is because Christ has gone through them. And I'm not greater than Christ. I'm not greater than Christ. So the trials that we go through are sometimes a reflection of Christ in us. So if you think about some of the trials you've been through, let, let's just say that maybe someone, someone, um, well, like I just said earlier, someone you know comes to your church and then all of a sudden they just leave without word. You know, uh, that's, that's disheartening. But that's what... They did to Jesus, right? There were 120 disciples, and Jesus makes this statement, you know, hey, unless you eat of my body, unless you drink of my blood, you'll not have any part in the kingdom of God. And some of them were scratching their head like, that's too hard for us to understand. And they just left. 120 left. And Jesus looks to, to Peter and goes, Peter, are you leaving too? And Peter looked at Jesus and said, Lord, where am I going to go? You have the words of eternal life. So Peter at least got it. Where else am I going to go? I need to stay here so I can learn more. I don't understand what you're saying, but I know you have the words and I need to understand and I'm not going anywhere until I understand what's going on here. But others just left. So if people leave in and out of your life, they did to Jesus too. So you're just like your Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what he's gone through. And Paul is this, again, he's not complaining. He's just stating facts. And then he goes on in verse 11. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may manifest in our mortal body. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. Now, he's saying basically that everything that happens to him is, is part of this world, and it's always creating death in us. It's destroying us. Uh, death is working something out good for us. It's killing our flesh. That's what death is, right? Yep. Death is ultimately the death of our flesh. <laughs> And that's where God wants us. He wants us to mortify the flesh so that life can be given to others. This is hard to understand. I was sharing this with someone else the other day. <clears throat> that a minister's life is not his own. When he gets called by God, in any of us, if we get called by God, God has called us to suffer. And we don't suffer for no reason. We suffer to reveal Christ in us. And our responsibility is to be faithful with what God has given us to do in, light of, in spite of the suffering. So we're going to suffer. We're going to go through hard things. But we still need to be faithful with what God has given us. And God will reward the faithful servant. So our life really isn't our own. It's not our own at all. It's, it's kind of like living in the world. When you're in the world, your life still isn't your own. You think you're in charge, but you're not. The God of this world, Satan, he's the one leading you and guiding you. You know, you live in the world, you don't live without God. And so, you know, what's the latest thing today? Marijuana. And so now you're seeing marijuana dispensaries. Not only are you seeing marijuana dispensaries, but now you're seeing the THC, you're seeing CBD uh, going out there. So now if you actually go to the stores, you'll look, you'll see hemp, an ingredient called hemp. 
and they're putting it in everything now. Hand lotions, body lotions, hair shampoo. You are now getting this marijuana, THC, hemp in a lot of different things. And so now it's opened up this Pandora of opportunities for companies to use hemp so that you, your skin feels better because you're using this stuff. You know, it regenerates you, makes you feel good, and so forth. This is all happening. And then you're thinking, wow, it's legal, so now I can just go and... You know, smoke a little bit. Just go behind the corner in the back of my yard and smoke and then grow a little plant. All of that stuff. It's okay. But the fact is, guys, you're doing that without your own will. Satan is the one leading you and guiding you. Oh, that is so stupid of you to say. How can you say that? I'm in control of my life. Okay, you keep thinking that. And it leads you right to death. We need to let God be in control. See, we're all slaves to someone. I don't care who you are, whether you're a Christian or not, you're a slave to someone. You're either a slave to Satan or you're a slave to God. And I'd rather be a slave to God and know where my eternal state is. So, verse 13. But since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, We also believe and therefore speak. And so Paul said, we believe the gospel, so we speak it. And you speak it too. We're all responsible to share our faith, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Wow, isn't that it? nice? One day we will all raise up to be with Jesus. I can't wait for that day. For all things are for your sake. I mean, in other words, it's a benefit to you all. That grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. When you truly understand God's grace, then there is thanksgiving that goes with it. Um, Several people I know recently, uh, family members have passed away. They're gone. <clears throat> now, if they are believers, then there's thanksgiving to be had there, if you truly understand God's grace, because you're going to be thanking God they're in heaven. And one day you'll get to go see them. You don't have a hope where you're like, I'll never see them again. This is it. This is the end. I will never, I'm going to mourn the rest of my life, and I'll never, ever, ever see them again. That's not hope, and that's not faith in God. Hope says, I'm going to see them again, and I can't wait to see them again, and I'm going to serve God until I see them again one day. But if you live in the world, if you live in the world, there's no hope to that. Now I understand why people mourn and mourn and mourn for their loved ones that have passed away, and because they'll never see them again. They'll be in hell. Now, if they're believers, they won't see them ever again. But if they're not believers, they'll see them maybe in hell. But the Bible says that it's so dark that you won't see anything. So chances are you won't see them there. So yeah, I would probably be mourning all day long too if I was a non-believer because that means they're separated from God for eternity. There's no hope there. The hope is in Jesus Christ and we have it in him. And there should be, it should cause, as he says here, and the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. For what he has done. Therefore, let's close with this. We do not lose heart. What does losing heart mean? Giving up, being mournful, having no hope, constantly seeing negative, negative, negative instead of what God has done and what he has opened up. Even though, or even through our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light afflictions Isn't that interesting? Paul says, our light afflictions. He just mentioned some of the things he's going through, and he's saying they're light. They're light. These light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. You can't compare them. You know, at the older you get, I'm at I'm at the age of 57 now. And I realize I'm at the end of my life. And as I look back to my life, man, it seems like it went by so fast. And I remember living it and thinking it was slow at times, but now it's like, wow, it's gone. I was invited yesterday to 
to an Orthodox Easter. The Orthodox Church celebrated Easter yesterday. <clears throat> this is a Russian Orthodox Church. And I, I went because I wanted to see what it was like. Very religious, very similar to Catholicism. Beautiful church. I mean, they had cathedral. Everything was in the, um, the broken tiles, what do they call that? Um, stained glass? Not stained glass, the tiles, what? Alabaster. Uh, no, it starts with an M, like a, a mere mosaics. So everything was mosaic on the wall, ceiling, the cathedral, and it was all Jesus in the, on the triumphal entry with his disciples. Beautiful, beautiful. Mary with his young Jesus, Mary with the baby Jesus. Beautiful church. And then I just watched them. They celebrated their, their Easter, eating like we would chicken and steak and various things. Then they had their open bar, which I thought was interesting. You know, very much like the Catholic church, you know, and so forth. But then um, the, the, the gentleman that invited me, he says, come to my house. Um, my estate sale is almost over. His wife passed away. Mm -hmm. And he wanted us to come to his house. And he basically said, without saying it, take whatever you want. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and so I'm walking around just looking at all this. And I mean, there was a lot of stuff. This lady was a collector. She had walls of plates, just... Uh, uh, dolls, porcelain dolls, and things like that. I mean, collector. And I'm looking at all this stuff. And now it, she's been gone for a while. So he's been living in this home uh, here, in, here in Corona. And then this home was actually in San Diego where I went. And he kind of goes back and forth. <clears throat> and he's been living in that home back and forth for years without giving it up. And finally he was able to let it all go. You know, and as I'm walking around, I'm just thinking of all this stuff, and I'm like, man, we accumulate a lot of stuff. And I realized for myself, I thought, I am rich because I have a lot of stuff. I'm really rich. I never, re I didn't, I've never thought myself of being rich, but I'm rich because the stuff that he had is kind of like what I have. And this man's a wealthy man, had his own bakery, just very wealthy man, two homes. And I thought, wow. But then the Lord, it's all going to burn. People are coming in, buying it, taking it. What she considered cherishable and hers, now someone else has. Mm. Some stranger. He's now just giving it away because he can't keep it. And it just reminded me so clearly that all the stuff we have is not important. Not important at all. It's just stuff. And it's going to sit there and collect dust. And there was a lot of dust stuff. He had CDs, VHS, that weren't even open. Mm. So that tells you a lot of their of her buying power. She was just buying to buy, right? And then put it up there, good deal, let's get all these videos. And then he just <laughs> sat there and never watched. A lot of new stuff like that. So it was really an eye opener. You're not taking it with you, none of it at all. Uh, it was an eye opener for, for me. No, um, we should be giving thanks for the, for the gospel message and nothing else. Therefore, do not lose heart, even though our outward reward, outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly eternal way to glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So perspective. And that gave me a different perspective in life as I walked through that. I didn't take anything because uh, I don't need any more stuff. <laughs> I don't want any more stuff. There was a nice, beautiful sword, uh, heavy, real sword, like Viking days kind of sword. I'm like, oh, I want that. And they wanted like a hundred and something dollars. And I'm like, oh. But I know if I would have said, I'll take this, he goes, just take it. He would have given it to me because that's the kind of person he is. And um, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that to him, but I left it there, and apparently he had several other swords. But even that piece of metal, which weighed, and I would have loved to have seen it in my office, you know. I have a tattoo that's got a sword, the sword, and it's got the spirit wrapped around it, the sword of the, of the Word of God. That's what I look at it as, so it means something to me. <clears throat> but I realized, too, that even that is going to perish. All these things will perish. It's only the things that aren't seen that are important. 
Thank you for viewing Devo 30 with us. Please share this Devo on your Facebook. And as I said, you can go to our website and look at any other New Testament book and get a 30-minute message on it. If you ever have any questions on Scripture, I encourage you to go there. And also support our ministry. Uh, the Lord will bless you for blessing us because of the work that God is doing here in the church. So you can go to our website at ccinland.org and just go to the donation tab and we'd love for you to support the work here of God. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. If you have any prayer requests, please post it and we will pray for you.